if you look at where things were in like the early 50s, 60s, and then how it stipped, skipped up to people like Marley Mole mm. kind of figuring out how to program in a different way, mm. then leaping it 30 years to like what Dilla was doing and playing around with how NPCs worked and, mm -hmm. you know, the the idea of how Akai were building things and samplers and then it skipped again to this idea that it's on a computer screen, you mm. know, and you don't have to, like, meticulously bend and shift all of these buttons to do different things with it. It's like we've been moving towards this point our entire lives mm. in that way. So, like, you know, as much as, yes, there's, like, the the Gen Z generation of, okay, yeah, there's there's all this crazy technology going on. If you talk to our parents and their parents before that, this has been happening for 40, 50 years. Killer Killer Podcast. Killer Killer Official Street Cards. Street Culture TV. Beatbox created. Killer Killer. We need to talk about world music and street culture. Killer Keller podcast. So much to look at, man. There's like a sensory overload. It's sick. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and then an I come, and then there's even more sensory explosion. <laughs> the best. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Killer Keller podcast, live and direct, central London for your noggins. As central as you need to be. You don't need to be anywhere else. This is prime time uh, telecasting business. Um, big shout out to the sharers and carers. People have been invested in putting the time in and listening to uh, myself and all my awesome uh, guests from day dot. Uh, it's all about street culture. It's all about sporting art. Uh, if you haven't got it, go get the television app, free download, iPhone, Android. Um, for your street culture sports. Um, big shout out to our sponsors, the Mighty Hoddle Warriors crew over at the Crypto Moon Boys Hideout. That's some NFT business for you. Yeah, it is. Um, inside the house, it's a production day. It's a producer <laughs> day. It's a beat maker day. It's one of them serious days where we get in under the hood of, of the producer and the moving parts that create their music. Uh, this is about work ethic. This is about hip hop genre. This is about the beats, the rhymes, the life, the samples, the life and times of this guy. Collaboration extraordinaire, not to mention new EP on the way aspects. It's Vice Beats inside the house. Big ups, man. Thank you for having me. How are you? I'm good, man. What do I'm you know? good, I'm good. We're here. <laughs> know many things and no things all at the same time. It but, is, isn't it? Yeah. People yeah. say, how's it going? And sometimes it's almost like, what do you mean, how's it going? I don't Which know. Which bit? <laughs> yeah, I don't know myself. It's just going. <laughs> yeah. There's definitely some going going on. You yeah. do a lot of production for a lot of people, don't you? I mean, I was yeah. looking through the resume, and this is some back catalog. I'm a fan for a while, I understand, but the resume, like the amount of... <laughs> at any one singular time, it just seems like you're constantly by a sampler or a laptop. I'm, I'm trying to do do as much as I can, really, man. I mean, it's, it's my happy place. You know, like outside of family, making music is the one. Mm. You know, and it's like I... It's just... It's in me. You know, and I think I've got to that point now where, like, using all different types of equipment. I mean, for a little bit, I had an MPC. It didn't really resonate. Like now, for a, well, for a long time, I've been using Logic. So I've got an MPD and I've got keys and I get by with like a bit of bass and a bit of guitar. But like, I just, I love it, man. Like mm. just making music, there's there's nothing quite like it. And it that that's the drive with it. You know, above and beyond the getting it out there, it's just that therapy of actually making it. And that blank canvas of being like, right, where's this going today? Mm. And not knowing, like, I love that feeling. But yeah, it's it's been an interesting time. I've I've been really lucky to work with some amazing artists and do lots of different projects as well. You mm. know, and some that are kind of quicker wins and like things that just seem to organically happen relatively fast. Is that what you mean by quicker wins? The, yeah, the speed of just it all? yeah, just kind of like, oh, that's a nice song. Cool. Let's let's get that out. Like as opposed to. Yeah, you know, the the Dilla tribute album I made that took seven years. You know, and Dilla it's, tribute album. And yeah. now that is a tall ask for yourself. <laughs> it really from is. Somebody to <laughs> it's a lot, isn't it? It is, and like seven it was, years. Yeah, it was an amazing process. But I think for for me, I wanted to make sure that what I was doing was legit because mm. everyone's aware how messed up the Yancey family have been in terms of all the legal side and money side mm. and. I wanted to make sure I stepped correctly on that front. Mm. So it took a long time and a lot of effort, but it it connected the dots in lots of different ways. So mm. you know, that album samples Miguel Atwood Ferguson's Sweet for Marjuk. So like I was taking something that 
hadn't been touched. I think I'd found like one track where someone had done a basic loop of it. But I didn't want that. I wanted to make something where you couldn't quite tell where the sampled music ended mm. and the live instrumentation on my side began. And uh, Almost like a knitted, almost like woven into yeah, sound. Yeah, exactly. Feel shit. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, and that's the thing. That's what I love about it, man. Like the with the sampling side, like whether it's me playing something or whether I've got other people playing or whether it's like picking something up from Splice or grabbing a vinyl and sampling that, whatever it is, mm. I just like that feeling of, of that fusion mm. of like the live and the sampled sounds. And a lot of the time, like it's that, that feeling of people being like, oh, damn, well, that's, that's not a sample, that's live, or that's this or that's that, mm. and kind of not quite knowing where it starts and ends. It's like I, I love that process of being able to merge those different parts. Mm. And, you know, I, I'm in a really, really good position now in terms of I think when when I first started out with music, it was, you know, like it was very different in terms of it was it was you found your connections locally mm -hmm. or on like MySpace or yeah. SoundClick or like random stuff yeah. like that. Whereas now it's like I work with people all over the world. So mm -hmm. like my harpist and my flautist are in LA, like a guy that regularly does guitar and bass for me like greg green like he's he's in holland like you know the the album i've got out there's people from various countries on there and it's like i i love the open doors element of it in that way so it means i can just find the right quality in terms of the music side you know and I need to, explore it I, I think i need to just throw a bit more context to what you're saying here because i i'm starting to capture a picture of almost like a, <clears throat> on one side you've got the elements of uh, splice and sample packs. Mm. You then got on the other side, you've got the original samples from the original records. That mm. holds its own energy in itself. That is all determined on the room, yeah. the space, the drums, whatever the instrument is, is. But then you add the genre and the generation mm. of the influence that's coming in. So you're saying that, that you know, you've, you've, your um, instrumentalists are from other countries and probably from different age demographics. Yeah, yeah, quite a mix. Yeah, you know I mean, and then you finalise that with your own touches to it, the use of the plugins, the sound, and and what you're left with is something like you say, a very rich, embellished, um, almost future forward way of production but 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 essentially it's it's almost like layers upon yeah. layers like a like a painting like a like a tapestry <laughs> thanks man that's a beautiful Am analogy yeah. yeah no it's a it's a great way to look at it i think i'll just walk around with you, you know by my side all the time when i'm pitching my music <laughs> it'll go far better than me doing it <laughs> hey, it but, works <laughs> <laughs> but yeah definitely i i think it that idea of layering is is definitely the thing my side it's like i I really enjoy that journey of exploration within sound, mm -hmm. you know, and it and it goes into all sorts of places. You know, I I know that I can like chop up a boom bap beat relatively quickly, mm. but then it's it's the little textures and the sounds and the elements to put into it that you know I I know that I'm not necessarily doing something that's groundbreaking in that way. People have done stuff that I'm doing, but at the same time, it's like you say, it's kind of my own take on it. Mm. Like I. I really like found sound and you know I'll, I'll found kind of, sound? so like the idea of just recording like environmental sounds around you mm. so like for example one 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 example of that would be a different different vibe but same kind of context is on my album that's coming out i've got a whatsapp message that's my son's heartbeat so oh, like get so out. like so when it was all the covid stuff like you couldn't go into doctor surgery so my wife was sending me his heartbeats mm. so like i used that and like chopped it up and made it into percussion loop no you way know? and it's like i i'm forever like i mean I'm like, whenever we we go to like anywhere that's got vague nature elements like i'll always be kind of stopping off and using voice memo on my phone and recording random bits and Some seeing David what i can do with it. <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> and it's like i love that stuff man it's like i yeah, I mean, and I kind of encourage my students to do that stuff as well. It's like, you know, I'll, I'll have like times where it's like, right, let's just get a drumstick and just bash something and see if it makes cool sound and we can like play around with that and loop it up and you know, see what you can do. Cause, it's the funk, isn't it? You, you yeah, get these yeah. sounds and you, you funk with them. Yeah, 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 exactly. And I think that's the thing, isn't it? That's the fun part. You know, you, you never necessarily know where that goes. And I think actually that... That's part of the thing that's taken a lot of time with music is that I remember when I was 
more learning my craft, I'd hear something be like, I want to make something like that. I can hear it in my head. I can hear that sample. That's going to go like that. And I think I've learned to let go over time where it's like, actually, I'm just going to play around with this and see where it leads. And that bit ultimately is more enjoyable because it's like, yeah, like if it doesn't end up what it was meant to be initially in my head, so what? It's still turned into something. It's still created something that wasn't previously there. And That's quite like, a hard thing, isn't it? To kind of let go really of is. Your, yeah. your preconceived ideas. Yeah, definitely. It really takes a long time. And I think that's the thing, isn't it? It's like, you know, I've I've worked within youth work for years and like later down the line as a lecturer. And like I, I've met so, so many aspiring musicians. And I think that's one of the things that I've found is a big stumbling block that they they really zone in on, I want to make something like that artist or mm. I want it to sound exactly like that. Or they just pretty much carbon copy what they're hearing. Mm. And it's that skill of over time letting go and just being like, you know what, I'm, I like what I'm doing. Like, and if other people don't, then there's another lane for me to travel down and someone will. <laughs> you know, mm. And it's, yeah, 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 but it's, yeah. it's having you, that confidence with really, it, I guess. You just opened a bunch of conversations here um yeah if you don't take if you don't take ownership of an idea you'll go out into the ether and someone else will take it yeah exactly i love that i love that because it's that's the creative that's the creative mind at work yeah. um uh kids and that that you know intention of wanting to replicate to the point of plagiarism mm. and um what you're talking about from a letting go point of view uh it's decades of repetition. Yeah. You, you producers are renowned. <laughs> Whether it's the EQ on a particular snare that yeah. just takes five hours of continual hitting <laughs> or, or, or if it's just a spontaneous, oh, I found that sample, bang, 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 let's go. These sorts of things, they, they, yeah. they take time. And it's in, I guess for um, whatever age you're at, but starting somewhere, it, it takes a lot of, um, uh, it, it takes a lot of guts to mm. let go of that yeah. and find your own lane, doesn't it? Really a lot does. Of time. Yeah, it does. And I, I think part of it is being around the right people. Like you know, whether that's a case of on a personal level or whether it's a case of collaborators, I think you you need people who can be honest with you, who challenge you, and don't always say, "Oh yeah, that sounds great." It's like actually, let's try this. Let's try that. But I mean, one of the things that I love about people that I work with now, for example, like the Lassic, who's my saxophonist, like he, he's just not scared to try anything. And if it doesn't work, we just scrap it and try it again. And it's that kind of attitude of, okay, yeah, let's explore. Let's see what happens. Mm. And I, I remember when we first started working together, everything he plays is amazing. Mm. So like I'd hear it and be like, that's amazing. He's like, no, no, that's, that's not why we're taking it. Let's try it again. It's like, but I love that. And like that idea of kind of having to unlock from that and being like, right, okay, let's follow this process. Let's see where it goes. You're just shooting your load too soon. Kids. Yeah, you know, when you exactly. hear a sax, you know, it's just, oh, whoa. Because <laughs> yeah. It's such a sensual instrument, isn't it? Yeah, it's amazing. Ugh. And and I think that's, that's the thing that I've learned over time is that kind of patience element of, okay, I know this will get to the right place. And I, I like that process where like with... With my tracks, I, I save really early demos. And if I'm kind of, for whatever reason, like need a bounce or, of one or whatever it is, like sometimes I'll just take a bit of time and listen to that very first demo compared to the final version. Of course. And I love that. Like kind of seeing that growth of a song and being like, oh, right, yeah. That was just a 16-8, 16-8 repeat and now it's turned into this and it's got all these different parts and mm. all those elements. But I, especially with lyricists as well, I really like doing it where I'll I'll send them something relatively simple and then I build it around them. And one of the reasons why I do it is like I really enjoy that that moment of being able to send it over to them and like, oh wait, you've got like live strings mm -hmm. on this, <laughs> or you've got this person on it, or that's been added in, and where did that come from? Mm. And it's like it that element of surprise with music, because I don't think we really get that all that much. And it's like to be surprised mm. by your craft. Mm. And like I I take that take that as quite a big element of it where it's just nice to be able to to feel excited about what's being created because we all know that when you get to the tail end of it and you need to do all the admin bits mm -hmm. and all of the slog stuff you need all of that good stuff banked up where yeah. it's like cool okay 
this was well worth it because of all of those good things that yeah. happen along the way. Um, sending sending final versions to artists. I mean, it must be quite self satisfying to you know have pushed a tune along and then be totally surprised by the the, the commitment you've made to embellishing like a fully functioning orchestra yeah sax um if you've got uh just going back to the demo process into the final outcome so within that space do you do, do you go back listen to the demo just just to check whether you haven't chucked the baby out with the water <laughs> do you ever sometimes do <laughs> yeah like i think there's there's been a few tracks where it's felt like they especially if they've taken quite a while mm. it's like where is this leading and I mean, one of the things that I do is, is when it's a project as opposed to just a single release is mm. I I put all of the, the demos and draft tracks that I've got into a Logic project and I, I start putting them in the order and start stitching them together. What, as full I, body tunes or as... Um, yeah, so okay. like just, just kind of, yeah, so I'll just chuck in the bounce of it, whether it's MP3 or whatever. I know they're not going to end up as the final versions and over time... They'll get replaced out and replaced out, and basically eventually... you're just teasing yourself of like the body of work. But just <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. And it's I find it's a really firstly it's a good way to clarify where you're going. Yeah, because it it starts creating that narrative. Because I love stories. You mm. know, my my degree was in media production. Like I love films and books, and it's really? like I I really like that sense of narrative, and I try and. I, whether it's conscious or subconscious, I think it's a mix at different points. But I like that idea of putting story into projects. So, you know, like I I use a lot of interludes and skits and intros and all that side of things. And I know to like younger artists, that's quite old school. But mm. actually, it's more that I like telling a story through music. Mm. And like to me, the, the narrator is really important. But also there's there's making sure that there's a strong narrative line and there's a really clear start and end to it. Mm. And there's moments to reflect. And like that, I really like that Respite side of it. kind of thing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, um, so, Kendrick had a lot of that on his album as well. It's not yeah. so old school as you think. I think there's the, yeah. it has these, it's fashionable, isn't it? These exactly, producers yeah. Producers have these little fashion things that go on as well. Yeah. Internally. So, I mean, on, on, um, on Aspects, the guy who did the intro for the album... Like he did the strings. Aspects string is the name of the uh, release. Uh, by yeah, the way. Uh, yeah, yeah. New oh, album coming out. Yeah, come on. Um, so, so the guy who did the string arrangement for the intro of the album is Gabe Noel, and he did the strings for "To Pimp a Butterfly," <laughs> and it's like I, I mean, his you know, talking like, to Kendrick. Geez. Yeah, and that's the thing is like just I everyone like I think people connect with Kendrick in different ways, don't they? And like on. On my side, for me, it was just the production just got to me. Yeah. Like the idea that he was like leading the way and working with a lot of kind of really like the up there UK jazz circuit. And then kind of each album, it will be different areas of these. Was that the deal with Kendrick? He, he was working with... He was working with a lot of UK jazz artists really? and, you know, like doing some interesting things. I mean, he's got some quite strong UK links, which is great. Mm. But yeah, I mean, Gabe Noel is, is US based. But I, I really like the way that even with his strings, he seems to tell his own story. Mm. And and I think that's the thing with instrumentalists, isn't it? I mean, it's, you know, like, like your side with beatboxing. Yeah, like quite a few people can hold down just a simple beat. But then there's artists mm -hmm. like yourself where it's like, oh, okay, that. this is a song. Yeah. This is an experience. Like. Yeah. I'm going to take you from this moment and I'm going to have you in the palm mm. of my hand the whole way through and there's going to be all these dynamic shifts. Mm. And it's like, I, I I love that idea that that's, that's what instrumentalists bring to the table where they won't just say, oh, here you go, here's a four-bar loop, do what mm. you like. Mm. It's like, no, I'm going to make these rich sounds and let's see where we can go and let's explore it in that investment of time. Oh, yeah, so good, man. Um, so you've got me <laughs> going down the road of like how important it is from a strings point of view, like mm. these are, they 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 they're so they resonate so they really deeply with, the, with yeah. the human psyche, don't they? It's, it's a strange feeling, isn't it? It's like it you know, when people talk about that kind of hair on the back of your neck stuff. Like it definitely there's something something within strings that really create that goosebump moment. Yeah, and like it's not that many instruments can do it. Like a lone piano sometimes, Whoa. or like you know. Like you said about sax, like mm. there's there's certain tones within that. Mm. I think there 
they're very, very natural sounds mm. that seem to connect to the human condition in a way mm. where you just seem to be at one with that instrument, and that's beautiful. It's beautiful, yeah. man. And also, it's all, it's all about... I like the juxtaposition of the way instruments can fall onto certain genres. Mm. For instance... Uh, and I've said this before on the podcast, I went to see the Stooges play. Oh, nice. And, and they just had a saxophonist there. And, you know, that, that it, it leaning so, almost like a lead guitar would to this sleazy rock and roll. It's like all of a sudden <laughs> the, the sax takes this like whole different um, persona yeah, of just... Yeah, it gives it that kind of beauty element. Oh, yeah, yeah crazy, nice. man. It's cool, isn't it? And it's mm. like you, you see it in lots of different contexts where, like you say, it's not naturally that you'd expect it to be there but it adds so much mm -hmm. and like that that live element but i think that's that's where groups like the roots really understand the power of those things where it's like it's not just a gimmick mm -hmm. or a last minute thing of oh you know let's just chuck an additional instrument in it's like no each of these instruments hold power mm -hmm. like how can we put these together and kind of unify our forces and make this thing of amazing power and strength and mm. beauty and it's like it's yeah i mean just music's amazing on that front isn't it it yeah. can really take you on a journey yeah yeah, yeah it's, totally. it's why it's exciting and it's why it's fun to keep doing it and it you never really know where it's gonna go you never know where like, it's gonna go do you? no you never know a lot of people are ask actually well, the subject of where we're going, a lot of people will ask, how do you get yourself into this position where you've got this stable of high-end, you know, instrumentalists, mm. kind of accompaniments, people, personnel, personnel, <laughs> into creating your sound? How did... Because this is not a given, brother. Like, no, we, no, there's gonna no, There's going to be a lot of people not. here that'll be like... I mean, I get it because your personnel, and I know it because your vibe is... Proper on a level. You're Thanks, a good. You, you're clearly a grafter and a good en energy. So people respond to that. But there'll be people out there that's going. Well, I got good energy. <laughs> you know. So we really need to get Thanks, into the man. how. Do, how. How do you get yourself in that position as a producer? I th I think in part it's mutual respect is like the core of it. Like it's understanding firstly the right collaborations you need. Like, it's not just kind of approaching anyone. It needs to be that there's that personal link in that way. Mm. But also, it's like, on my side, so, you know, I know that a lot of the time I'm not able to pay musicians, but I make sure that, like, all of their royalties are sorted. They've always got a split. They've always got credit. Like, anything I do, everyone is credited. Mm -hmm. and, and a lot of producers don't do that. You know, if they've got guitar or sax or drums or whatever... Mm -hmm those musicians get absorbed. I mean, there's a lot of vocalists who don't even reference the producers, no, you know, sure, and yeah. it's like it, for me, that bit's important where that's, that's us building a portfolio of music together. So it's like they, they should get referenced in equal measure in that way, mm. you know, and, and I know that comes with its own challenges, especially with like Spotify where you can only have a maximum number of artists or that yeah. side. But, you know, it, even with socials and so on, I'll make sure everyone's, tagged and shared and all mm. that side and building a community essentially but i think on on my front like everyone that i work with i feel like i should be able to have a conversation with outside mm. of music and that should be sustainable like you know i i want i want to be able to like you know if they've got kids i feel i should know their names mm. like you know, I should be able to have those conversations with him. Like, I should know what their job is, like, where they live, all that side of things. Like, it, there should be a deeper connection Than there. just the music itself. Yeah, it's not like, oh, yeah, so you you do this this one instrument yeah. really well. It's yeah. like, actually, I care about you as a human. Mm. It's like, if you're not well, I want to know you're not well. Like, mm. if there's anything you ever need from me, I'll be here to more help. More of that, more of that, please. <laughs> yeah. You just said the word community as well, creating your own yeah. ecosystem of... Really important. Really. Um, that is so... <laughs> what, what we're talking about here is so... Um, unidentified mm. within, I guess. I guess some of it is because nowadays social media. Ooh, social media. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I say it so much on the podcast. I'm so bored of saying it, as if like it's <laughs> on trend. But it is true. Is it's like we uh, we lose the handshakes. Yeah. We lose the communicate. You know. And for a bit, it wasn't any better when we were coming up. It's just. Mm. It's just what it is. A lot. 
a lot of businesses suffer from the same fate. Yeah, for sure. If they don't give a fuck about their employees, if they don't give a fuck about their friends, people that do things within yeah. to help structure and build and make their um, ecosystem work, then why should anyone else give a yeah, fuck? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and I, I think that's the thing, isn't it? It's like, I think for me, that's been my career. You know, like, I, I started in youth work, I think, like, 2008, 2009, you know, and I was working with like Punch Records in Birmingham mm -hmm. and they gave me my first ever platform. Dude, it was a car crash. Like really? I, I had no clue what I was doing. <laughs> like, I literally turned up with a holdall with my desktop computer, my monitor, my little computer speakers and ran a production workshop. And actually it went surprisingly well, but I had no clue what I was doing. Really? But, like, it's amazing. but I was like, I got paid for this. I love making this and I got paid for it. And then it it kind of just, it got in my blood and I was like, I want to do this all the time. I want to meet these amazing kids. I want to get out in the world and do this. And it it was brilliant. You know, I was traveling around the country doing all these different music workshops and it, and then it kind of slowly got to this point of, okay, like I'm, my family's building, like I'm, I'm building my career and I want to do something a bit more solid where it's not just jumping around all these places i want to see the same kids each week and i mm. want to develop them further and like i i started getting involved in longer term projects and then i i think for me that's the thing is like that sense of community really really runs deep where it's like i i love that side mm. you know and that element of being able to to build each other and like i, I i'm a firm believer in in getting it so that everyone can teach each other whatever that means it might be little bits here and there but it's like it's that empowering movement with it and it it's important you know and i think it's it is underrated because actually like a, a prime example of that is in 2010 i set up a, a hip-hop festival for young people in bristol mm -hmm. and um it's called xlr and we had a really good budget for it like really healthy it was kind of before all of the education collapse were funding mm -hmm. and it was great and it worked and it was five days, but then we couldn't get funding for the next year. We literally ran the second year of event because everyone in the community wanted it to happen on 600 quid. It was so much better. Like we had sponsorship, we had artists performing for free. We had all these different things happening and off the back of it came amazing things. You know, like, so actually from that one, like we had Gardner, like the, the artist who it. kind of and gets involved in Darbo. Like he's, yeah. Gardner's incredible. Yeah, but like he, growing up, yeah. And he, that was, he won our competition and he got like sponsorship for a year. He got studio time. He got clothes support. He got all these different things off the back of it. Got a video with Chris Lucas, did all that stuff. And it's like that that sense of community just kept on building and building. And when it was time to say, right, okay, let's make some regular weekly music sessions here. We had the local community like donating instruments to us. Completely back in you. Yeah. All and being like, done. great. Okay. Yeah. Let's make this space work. And we, we made essentially a storage cupboard into a live room, stripped out the studio, managed to like get crowdfunding, we had local organisations who, who were running music, music sessions saying, look, we've got older gear, but you can have that if you want. So I'd like donating outboard gear and it it pulled together and wow. it's those kind of movements where it, I think that's that stuff's really stuck with me throughout my mm. career. You know, and How I, easy is that to pull off? It's a lot of graft. Mm. You know, it's like, it's a lot of graft. And, and I think that's the thing is that it's, it's that challenge and perseverance that you have to have faith in the longer term goal, I guess. Is that, that the secret in a longer term goal? The community values, the people that are around you? The I think to a, to a degree in the sense that it sometimes it's very subtle in the sense that it's the betterment of communities, whatever that means. So, you know, whether it's a case of... What does betterment mean? Explain I, what that means. I think, I think to me, it's like a lot of it roots in confidence, whatever that looks like for, you know, especially when we're talking about young people in mm. this context, like... You know, I've worked with so many young people where they they have skills but they don't see it. And or it might be that they haven't got a specific skill set, but they're kind or mm. they're funny or they've actually got natural leadership skills mm. or whatever that looks like. And I think it it's that that opportunity for them to actually have someone invest some time and be like, right, I believe in you. 
and I'm going to continue believing in you and it matters that you're here. Mm. You know, and I think that's been one of the big things for me and it's like there's there's been quite a lot of projects over time and I I ended up initially getting into like college teaching and I I just moved those ethics into that mm -hmm. so if my students didn't turn up i would call them like i wouldn't get kind of our education team to do it i'd do it because then they've got that connection there and it's like i care that you're here why are you not here mm. and it's not having a go at them it's more a case of is something up can i help with something mm. you know and it does mean that it's more time mm. and it does mean there's more energy and you know i'd end up in all sorts of random situations where it's kind of helping helping parents out, I'd know their parents, I'd know their carers, like they would know me on a very different level because I wanted to make sure that they, that they were all right, you know, and, and they could fulfill what they could do, you know. I, the amount of times whilst I was doing college stuff where I'd have parents like emailing or coming back to me and just saying they never achieved anything at school, like they never managed to do these things, wow. they're doing it, hmm. you know, and like I've... I still have students who I worked with like four, five, six, seven years ago now who are still contacting me on Instagram mm. and being like, I mean, some of the ones are quite sweet where it's like, hello, sir. Mm. But like, you know, when it's the college level, like they know my first name, but like they... Down the pub, never a drink. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and that's, but that's the thing is like, you know, I still have that where like I had quite a few of my, my kind of students right before COVID, um, they they had a lot of change and we, we kind of went on quite a journey together in terms mm. of their education time. And as soon as all the COVID stuff stopped, they were like, oh, we're, we're all going to get together and like see each other. Like, can you come for a drink and come to the pub with us? That's so and cool. like when, because I, I got made redundant in my teaching job because of COVID mm -hmm. and um, they bought me some kicks as a going away present. Like they bought me Jordan 4s. Stop. Like... Yeah, you know, and they one of the, one of them like came to meet me for a, a kind of socially distanced coffee and was like, obviously we're not all allowed to all be here, but we were all wanted to send our love to mm. you and here's a card and here's a present from us and like they they talked to my wife and like found some kicks on StockX and mm. like bought those for me and it's like it it's all those things where you know see the monetary side isn't the point it's more that 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 sense of community is so key yeah. you know and I. So and I'm, the value as well. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I'm I'm part of a, an event in Bristol called Hip Hop Coffee Shop Sessions, and like the one of the reasons why I got involved in it was that community ethos. Like it's been going for like five years now, and um, they're just they're beautiful little ecosystems of hip hop, you know. And it, Bristol loves a nice little ecosystem. It really, especially does. when coffee a coffee shop <laughs> and a cider's involved, isn't it? Yeah, for sure. <laughs> And I think that's the thing that I really love with it is like it, you know, they, the guys that I work with, like Luke and Ian, they've, they've given me the space to kind of bring my, I guess, kind of slightly softer approach to all of this because hip hop isn't new to me. Hip hop mm. is my life. Mm. You know, like it has been since I was like, really, I mean, the first time kind of hip hop really, really got to me was when I was like 12, 13 and mm -hmm. like, you know, it's Bug stuck got with, you. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like it's not released me ever since, but like I, so it, it means more than, oh yeah, we're just going to get some bars on. Like it's, mm. it's like, no, it's, it's about the community It's mm. connecting everyone. So like we, we have it where like the nights are in a coffee shop and like you can hang out, drink hot chocolate. We have Dutch pancakes there. So like people can just hang out, see live hip hop, have pancakes, and just chill. And it's like, it's dead yes, groovy, ain't it? Yeah, oh, it's Danish well good. Pastry any day, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So like it's, and it just, wow. I think that's the thing is it's that community stuff mm. that really matters. And a lot of people like we were kind of touching on briefly with the social media stuff. I think for me, I've learned that that that's just a tool. Like, that's not the be-all or end-all. That's no, tool, You yeah. know, and it's, it's right. like, and that's the thing is that it's not taking advantage of people. It's taking advantage of technology in mm. that way to connect with the people behind mm. the tech. And it's like, I, a, a lot of the musicians that I work with, it's like, if I haven't met them, we'll still kind of keep in touch and talk. But, you know, like my harpist is coming over to England and, like, we'll definitely meet. You know, like one of the singers that I'm working with, like Shelley Harland, who's amazing. She she's like on Jazzmatazz, like you know, she's an incredible singer. Wow. You know, but like she's again, you just give this, this other year. things that you all of a sudden your your fault lines of connectivity 
a pretty vast one. <laughs> What's your yeah. okay? So look, um, we wouldn't be future forward of, or of any relevance, possibly even next month, if we didn't bring <laughs> up the subject of AI and how that has changed the the perception of just getting shit done mm. and beats music overall has just become this linear soundtrack for people's social media content yeah. um unfortunate do we define it as music Fuck, it's debatable ai however is it's not music yeah. it's not music but what it is <laughs> it's an enabler yeah it's a ma- for sure it's a machine it, it'll serve out whatever you want yeah so if you're an ensemble maker, a uh, uh, producer by ev- in every description of the, mm. the term. How are you facing that reality? I mean, I think ultimately, like the the thing that we do. Yes, of course, like a computer at some point could probably make something sound quite nice, mm. but it's the connection side of it, and that that can't be replaced by a computer because no. ultimately it, we are human and humans do love humans most of the time mm. like they want that human connection and interactivity in that way and I even think haters love your people remember that yeah exactly <laughs> they care in their own weird way but <laughs> it's yeah it's i think that's the thing on my side is like you know i i just figure i'm i'm gonna continue doing the thing that i love and mm. you know that that's not gonna go anywhere in that way it's like there's there's going to be space and probably more and more space mm. for computer powered stuff in that way. But I mean, ultimately, like we're of a generation where we were the beginnings of AI because we use computers. If you look at like sticking on the production tip for a minute, like if you look at where things were in like the early 50s, 60s, and then how it stipped, skipped up to people like Marley Mole mm. kind of figuring out how to program in a different way, mm. then leaping it 30 years to like what Dilla was doing and playing around with how NPCs worked and, mm-hmm. you know, the the idea of how Akai were building things and samplers and then it skipped again to this idea that it's on a computer screen, you mm-hmm. know, and you don't have to like meticulously bend and shift all of these buttons to do different things with it. It's like we've been moving towards this point our entire lives mm. in that way. So, like, you know, as much as, yes, there's, like, the the Gen Z generation of, okay, yeah, there's there's all this crazy technology going on. If you talk to our parents and their parents before that, this has been happening for 40, 50 years yeah. in different forms. And I, I think it just feels like it's kind of the natural next step, really. I mean, we hold things in our pockets that are some of the most powerful computers in the world mm. in that way. Like, they're nuts. You know, mm. and the idea of, like, that's come from something where the only thing you could do is play Snake on a 3210. Mm-hmm. That's 20 years ago. You know, like... Yeah, yeah, it's, it's true. It's, it's actually not too... I think where my mind goes is the reduction of what... Um, we're talking about reduction here. That's mm. where I'm going. We're talking about reduction here because... What used to be big band turned into skiffle, turned into four piece, turned into yeah. three piece, turned into, you know, um, production values of record to MPC, mm. MPC to laptop computers, etc. Now you can work in the box. You don't even need yeah, instruments. Yeah, yeah. And similarly with all the streaming generation stuff as well. It's right? reduction, isn't yeah. it? Everything is constant reduction. But mm. but do you feel like to the point where, I guess. Where I'm going with this in my head is where everything in reduction is getting squeezed out of the the processes of making music. I guess that only leaves one um, conclusion. And I guess from a producer's point of view, it's almost taking a few steps back to the, the, the NERD Timberland era of personalities within production. Almost like I, you know, be, be your own brand no matter how it's being produced, whether it's AI or whatever, it's like. Yeah. But how do you forge your own sound when everything's being reduced to to to, to the standard and and request of technology? It's a tough one, isn't it? I mean, I, I think I've definitely noticed over the last few years that there's, in a weird way, there's a bit more space for personalities as producers. I think mm. people, there's this weird split where 
there's artists who don't care who makes the beats for them. Mm. It's just a beat. But then there's the other side of it where there's more and more people coming through who are interested in the artistry of yeah. production. And I think actually, like I know a lot of people hate on streaming, but I think that has empowered people to have choice in terms of their listening. 100%. Like and it's, it's amazing on that yeah, front. Yeah, yeah. You know, I I meet like 13, 14 year olds mm. who are like, oh yeah, yeah, like I, I listen to Kendrick, like I love Dillers, Dillers beat tapes, I love all these different things. And like the the stuff they're naming, mm. I wouldn't have had a clue at that age because no there's way. no access to it. No. You know, and it's like, and I think on on my front, like that's been quite exciting in the sense of being able to say, okay, cool, like this is this is my life and my part in this yeah. scene. And it's like, I, I kind of believe in just being me on that side of things when it comes to all this social front and personality side. I mean, I... You know, when I when I host events, I kind of come to life in a different way. And it's quite funny when I, especially when I have students and so on who are like, oh, yeah, you're, you're really chilled in the classroom. And then they'll come to one of my events and I'm like shouting through things and like getting all hyped. And they're like, who are you? Wow. <laughs> it's like, but I guess it's like, it's still me. It's still mm. me talking. It's just those different elements. And it's similar to all the social stuff really, isn't yeah, it? Where you, true. you kind of have your own brand. And like, I think on my front, in terms of branding, like I've I've gone down the route that I love art, I love street art, and like I I love that element of hip hop culture and have done for a long time, but also love nature yeah. and you know I a lot of my my artwork for my projects fuses those elements, mm -hmm. you know, and it's like I I try and go down a route of not just bog standard stock images but if it even if it does have to be a stock image for something because i can't afford something all the time it's still something that's relevant to me as a person mm. that i can stand behind and be like yeah that's me it's not trying to like cater to anyone else it's like if i put something out and i feel like it's comfortable my side mm. and when we were talking about collaborations it's the same thing like i i've had a lot of artists over time who said oh can we work together on this that and the other but I just don't connect with what they're doing. Like I don't really? connect with either them as really? a human or with their lyrics as you well. Yeah, 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 quite a lot. Wow. And okay. like, and we'll it, be saying no names, but no. shame, shame. But, like, but that's the thing, isn't it? It's like, you know, I think, like we were talking about at the start, I think it, you have to be able to connect as a human over the musical element. Yeah. Like you have to be able to sit down, you know, at, that's my my values. Not mm -hmm. everyone's like that, but like I, I need to feel that the people around me are good people, yeah. and like I don't want to work with people where I have a feeling that they'll do that and they might shyest me, but then also shyest other people at the same yeah, time. Yeah. And it's not to say that I haven't been burnt by it, where mm -hmm. I've kind of thought that there's artists who are gonna be good and they turn out bad. You know, mm -hmm. I think that's the music industry, unfortunately, yeah, but or, or just industries. <laughs> you know, like. But yeah, it it takes some time on that front, I think. But yeah, you know, I I definitely like I've found kind of being vice beats in that way, like that. That's one of those things where it's becoming more fluid in mm -hmm. the sense that there's my life as James Kennedy, there's my production life as vice beats, and and especially being being a lecturer where. I'm at university stage, so my students go out. So they'll see me at events. They'll see me doing different things. Mm. They're actively buying like people's vinyls and releases. They're part of the music community in a different way because mm. they're they're users of those those activities and all that side of things. Whereas when I was working with younger students, they didn't notice it. You know, like it's yeah, not their just... world. You know, so, yeah, so you're with this level of, uh, an ear to sophistication already. Yeah, exactly. Mm. And it's like, you know, so at the, the uni that I work at, so I, one of, so I'm freelance, but like one of the unis I work at is BIM in Bristol. And, um, BIM in Bristol. Um, that up. Yeah, yeah, Bristol's great, man. Yeah, but, man. um, so I've, I've been creating a, a hip hop social. So like fortnightly, the students have just got time to just hang out and connect. And like it's producers, it's MCs, it's like singers. So good. Like live instrumentation, it's brilliant, man. And it's like whenever How there's immersive. been. You must be just like so in the thick of every <laughs> single it's, month. It's great, man. It's I love it. Like it's, you know, and the idea that I, that was possible is just nuts because it takes over the main atrium space of the building as well. So it's like three floors. Wow. So there's just hip hop going through the rafters because yeah. like the. 
the idea is that like I just create a wall of noise for two hours and like if they're not playing anything I'll play some of my stuff and like I'll play them stuff I've just worked on like it's very much kind of work in progress really? and it's like feedback basically. yeah 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 exactly and it's like you know I, a few weeks ago some of my students were like can you play the worst beat you've ever made and I was like digging through my hard drive and like chucking that on a system and it's like Whatever, you know, like, let's have some fun with it. How many are there? How many would be in a I mean, single setting? 20, 30, um, just dotting around. We have it yeah. like the kind of LA beat scene, though. It's a long tables yeah. and, like, a mixer in the middle and people can just plug in. So, like, you know, sometimes people bring samplers. Like, we had a guy who brought, like, a, a dub siren and was playing around with that. Like, if there's artists visiting Bristol that I know they're coming in, I'll just invite them in to come hang out with the students. Yeah, so like, this is crazy. You know, it's great, man. It's like, you know, it's just a, a really, really nice kind of ecosystem that's forming with it, you know. And it, Where do you keep your energy from? Where does this... <laughs> I mean, you really fucking love it, don't yeah, you? Yeah, really do. Where I just believe in it. Like, you know, I think it... You know, honestly, man, it's like it's... It's the generation of artists, like my, me growing up into hip hop, it's like, you know, yourself and Mark being Blade and Jest and Roots Manoeuvre. And there was that time in music where I could see that people cared mm. and they were traveling around the country because they loved music, mm -hmm. you know, and it's like... I, Not just the artists, the punters as well. Yeah, 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 exactly. And it was that sense of community and it's like, I remember just like going from Birmingham and taking coaches down to Jazz Cafe and seeing all these amazing mm. artists, you know, like Slee and Slum Village and like Primo and you know, Ty and whoever, like anyone, like just that, just absorbing the scene in that way. And I think it, I know it's changed over time, but actually like I, it feels like now it's kind of digital digging, but it's still digging. Mm -hmm. It's like, I know that there's artists where, yeah, I'm not spending much time in record shops, but that mm -hmm. feeling of, oh, there's that nugget. Oh, this tune's amazing. Mm -hmm. Oh, who is this artist? Like, I love that. You know, and it it keeps me excited about it. You know, I've got a, a playlist called Wordsmiths that I've set up basically for myself for a good few years. And I think it's like two days worth of hip hop. And I just, I keep adding to it and it's like, who are these artists? And it's well, just... Wordsmiths in like art MCs and stuff. Yeah. So who are your, who are your top three Wordsmiths? Oh, dude. Um, Black Thought has to be up there. Okay. Um, Blue, who I'm still getting my head around actually working with. Okay, and I don't... Type blue. Yeah, Blue's awesome, man. And then it, I don't know, because there's so many artists that I love. I think if it was of this moment, possibly Loyal Karna. Because I just love what he's doing and what he's standing for. And I think when when I was with Wordplay, like, you know, we we were really early stage supporting him. Like, we were one of the first places that was kind of picking up on what he was doing. Wordplay's awesome. Big up Wordplay Yeah, all man, day. big up the Wordplay team. Yeah. Nev, Nev is a legend. Relentless as well, you know, yeah. keeping on moving. Yeah, man. Like, what, 23 plus years yeah, and yeah. counting. And it's, it's like... thing, man. Beautiful. really is. Mm. And uh, it it's that whole thing that watching those kind of artists flourish and grow, I think that's part of it for me. Like I know there's a lot of people who like to kind of keep it to themselves. Mm. But I like the other side. I like celebrating artists and being like, wow, okay, look at this. This is awesome. How can we share this? Mm. And, you know, but yeah, I mean, in terms of MCs, it's a hard one because it's like I think different days will be different people, mm. you know, and it's like it's different moods in, in that way. You know, like I... I love so, so many MC styles and lyricism and it's yeah. it's such a I deep mean, scene. It is. I, 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 uh, Bobby V um, did that Tell Me tune back in 2009 that had Lil Wayne feature on it. Mm. That verse from Lil Wayne on that one tune just... I, I struggle to leave it in the last couple <laughs> of weeks. I struggle to let it go because I'm like, that verse... That middle eight is everything. Yeah. And, and, I'm, and I'm challenging it with all these other MCs, you know, ranging from Farrah to Buster, but, you know, you pick a particular week and yeah. you know the sun's out. It's one of them moods. <laughs> Bobby V, tell me, you know what I mean? MT basic, TV basic extravaganza of a tune of its time. Yeah. But Lil Wayne on that verse, it's so hard sometimes to, you know what I mean? Let go. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, you know, there's, there's so many brilliant art MCs that... Don't know how to execute on a record. Yeah, 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 for sure. They struggle. Like, yeah, they're the live artists. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I, I think that's the thing, isn't it? It's like it's that's where it gets really interesting in terms of those different types of artists and different types mm. of worlds with it. You know, I, I really like artists like 
Odyssey, who Odyssey is a really interesting artist because he's so chilled, mm. but mm. his lyrics are just incredible, you know, and the way that he translate on stage to how his records are is almost identical. Like it doesn't, he doesn't come with more energy, God, I love that. but he's just amazing. You know, and, and then like you were saying about Pharaoh and artists like that, where they just straight rip things up every time. But then there's the artists who are doing really interesting things in terms of creativity. So yeah. you know, I was saying about Loyal Karna, but that whole camp, yeah. you know, like Bonkers. like Barney Artist and like Lil Sims and mm. Koji Radical and this kind of new yeah. era that yeah. is kind of getting thrown into this UK jazz scene yeah. in its own way. Yeah. But ultimately it is hip hop. Yeah. You know, but like artists like Blue Lab Beats who are just creating this incredible backdrop of mm. music to then bring through artists like Kofi Stones and all that side where you just think, this is exciting. Yeah. You know, like there's there's yeah. things happening in this scene where we're at a point where it feels like there's this interest emergence where there's now artists in the scene who they've come up as their formative years with grime and to a degree would drill mm. and kind of the stuff that, you know, we were we were in our twenties when these things twenties, like early thirties when these things were happening. Mm. Whereas for them, that was their teens. Mm -hmm. It was the key years. Yeah. So they're hearing that and being like, Oh yeah, I was listening to one forty rhythms in that way. Mm. So then when they're bringing in their lyricism, they've got that element, but they're also hearing the live sound. So like there's these really wow, yeah. interesting elements of artistry that are coming through where you just I mean, you know, like Little Sims is is like one of yeah, those artists that yeah. you just think, how? Yeah, yeah, yeah. She's like, sick. you know, and just the production levels and obviously like the the idea that the production's coming through the salt camp. And I mean, salt in itself is like, that movement is just nuts. Like... <laughs> Yeah, you know, every... ain't kidding. He's on the he's on the front line <laughs> of what is going on, and you've clearly invested a lot. You must spend a lot of time uh, going through every music. Day. Yeah, every yeah. day, and it it feels like almost this kind of physical feeling of. I notice if I'm at home for too long and I haven't been able to access music for a bit, it's almost like this physical tension that mounts, where it's like. I need to listen to stuff. I need that release. Mm. Like I, I need to just realign and settle and listen to something. And it's like it. I guess to a degree, it's that, it's that rhythm in there. Like it's, it's the way that your body moves and yeah. the way that your, well, it's, it's like circadian rhythm stuff, yeah. isn't it? Where you, you kind of have such a defined way of your own body interpreting the world. Yeah. And for me, that's hip hop. You yeah. know, like that. That's my pace. I'm mm. slow talking. I'm relatively slow moving. I mean, even in the gym, I'm not running that fast. <laughs> you know, like, it's just, I I kind of just like being at that kind of slow, steady pace and just getting on with stuff and, you know, just being creative in different mm. ways. And it, you know, I, I'm not the loudest. I'm not, like, the craziest of artists. But, like, the stuff that I make, I like making it. Mm. And I, I love consuming it. Like, I love music. You know, we've... We've got so many vinyls in our house and, you know, like so many kind of silly things that are part of this scene. You know, I mean, like I've I've got a massive collection of vinyl toys, you know, and like my, my shoes are size 11. So like I don't have a huge amount of them, but they're huge. So like mm. they, they kind of take up way too much space. Yeah, and it just they're like boats of like Jordan <laughs> 1s all over the place. But like it, I just love every element of this. And like I've, from like the clothing side to all of it you know i mean i i was really close years ago to making my own clothing line like i was calling it sketch and i i had everything i had designs i'd printed stuff i was giving it to artists it was kind of starting to do its thing hmm. and then i was like i think one or two weeks away from like my biggest print run and then my computer got stolen and it was like that was it you know it was a time when i didn't have backups it wasn't working wow. in the same way and like bye bye hmm. brand hmm. And it kind of, it killed the energy of it. I couldn't get all of the designs back, all that side of things. But I think on that side of things, it's, I find it really interesting the way that paths go. Because mm. like after that, I then met Soapbox Clothing, which was a Birmingham based brand at the time. Like one of the guys, Daniel Lyles. Yeah, Soapbox, there you go. Yeah, man. Soapbox were awesome. Like they, um, they were just flat holding down the scene mm. there, like just smashing streetwear. 
So like I was helping them out with like their their website and text and copy and branding and all sorts of different things and getting involved in that. So I've always been interested in that side as well. When I moved to to Bristol, I got involved in helping Uchi Clothing. Mm-hmm. This amazing guy um, called Michael who runs Uchi Clothing. Um, and they've got their own shop called Over Here in St. Nick's Market. Mm-hmm. And their designs are a combination of hip hop and mathematics. It's amazing. Wow. Like brilliant, <laughs> brilliant designs. Yeah, you know, and it's it's always been interesting kind of having these different elements. And I think for me, like, you know, the I've tried all of it. You know, I remember at school like attempting to do graph. I was terrible. You know, like it just wasn't for me. Like, you know, my my beatboxing still is kind of at like boots and cats stage <laughs> in the grand scheme of things. Yeah, you know, like I can I can impress You're in the right the, house for that fixing. Yeah, Gosh, man. Yeah. Thanks. Like um yeah, I mean I, I think I can impress like minus five year olds yeah, yeah. like they're yeah. like oh that sounds good but past that point they're like yeah probably shouldn't do that in public yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. but you. yeah my nephew's like that to me all the time no matter how <laughs> badass i feel I'm, i am with him he's just so unimpressed always unimpressed <laughs> family <laughs> Bless him. oh dude big up lucas that's um yeah man big up lucas damn mm. no, and it's uh yeah it's hard being yeah. the uncle at the top you see yeah that's that's a problem um <laughs> yeah it is it is um the future's bright my friend isn't it yeah. let's be honest and i think for anyone wanting to great get a greater understanding of vice beats this podcast has been super enlightening um the the album aspects comes out when 26th of may so that's coming out on HHV and mm. EQ Music, which is my own imprint, which I'm, I'm expanding that a little bit more now. But yeah, a big, big love to HHV. Like they, they released Still of the Timeless Tribute as well. And I think that wow. that had a rough ride because it came out literally a month before the first lockdown. Mm-hmm. So um, that was interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. So I was, I was due to be flown out to Detroit for Dilla Day. There was kind of all these things that were going to happen and then Fuming. the world stopped. Yeah. So, um, but, you know, it, it's picking back up again. Like, you know, I, I had the, the really special moment of in, back in March of going to Berlin and like doing a masterclass on the album. Got to go to HHV and like kind of see the birthplace of my, my vinyls. And wow. like... Met met some random fan from China who just flown in that day and was like excited and it just this really kind of beautiful moment with it. But like I, yeah, I, I think it it feels feels really nice that it's got to this point because this album was very much created in a restrictive environment. Yeah, yeah. And it was trying to seek connection where there wasn't any. So you know, it was trying to find it where it was like mm. keeping artists connected, trying to find that that meaning in everything. Mm. And having it so that the voices of all of these artists could be heard irrespective of where they were in their situations. And it's like, I'm I'm really proud of it, man. It's it's by far the most personal piece of music I've ever made. You know, like the, and just every element of it has taken so long. Like Near Sky, the artist, I Yeah, I big, just, up, big up Near Sky, yeah, wicked artwork, wicked artwork, man. Incredible, like yeah. just an amazing artist and... I feel really lucky to be working with him because he he's put so much energy mm. into this. And I think it's one of those kind of really beautiful moments of like feeding energy. Yeah. So like his energetic force has kind of then ended up steering other elements of the album into different ways. So nice. Like on the on the twenty fourth of May, there's the there's the launch party at Lost Horizon, and it's like it that's a multi sensory event. So like Monkey Shoulder are getting involved, they're making cocktails on the night for the album. It's gonna be one of a sensory experience that is. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, exactly. Monkey Shoulder, come on. Yep. You know um, what time it is. Yeah, and big up Callum for that. Like, yeah, he's amazing. And um so Hip Hop Coffee Shop have got an exclusive coffee made for aspects. And then that coffee is going into the cocktails. We've got a photo exhibition from wow. Poet Curious. So like he's He's taken photos of different collaborators from the album and that's all kind of galaxy and, and exploration themed. Like we've got all these different elements to it and lots of little surprises on the night and it there's chapters to the night, you know, and it, it's like it's it's those kind of things where I I wanted to encompass to me what the the core value of this album was, mm. which is connection, you know, and it's which is why the first song that was released connected with with Blue and Napoleon the Legend like that. That had to be the first song because mm. that that's a great really, tune as well. Thank you, man. Dope. Thank you. Mm. Like, I'm I'm really proud of that one, and it 
that definitely kind of captured that moment, mm -hmm. you know, and that that blue verse really kind of started pulling together the project in that way because it some songs just do that, don't they? Yeah, 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 definitely. Like just that force of oh right, okay, this, this is, where is where this we're going. going yeah. yeah, I love that. I love yeah. that. That's where that's where body of work really comes into its own because you can't explain everything with one song. Yeah, it needs to have a response. Yeah, there yeah, has to exactly. Be a response into something. Yeah, definitely. I'm glad we're getting this podcast out. Uh, Early in the evergreen sense, <laughs> you can watch whenever you want, right? Yeah. But uh, the fact that you've got the launch and all these different mm. sensory elements that are coming into play that ultimately become the soundtrack, uh, well, the music becomes a soundtrack to the experience. Yeah, yeah. This is one hell of a, a project for you, bro. <laughs> it really is, man. <laughs> it's, it's been, it's taken over my life. Yeah. You know, it's like every day I'm working on so many elements with this and, you know, I... I've tried to take it to different places and spaces as well, you know, for an important part for me and help musicians make that side of things possible is being able to promote in different spaces. Mm. So like having the artwork like plastered up on the streets of Bristol, you know, like being able to kind of work work at Lost Horizon and use a venue like that in a different yeah, way. Heavy. and You know, like also kind of being able to get the music videos mm. that I wanted and working with Section Red because I... I love Oliver Whitehouse's stuff and I think he he as a director is incredible and you know he's such a storyteller and people don't use him as that and it was really really nice being able to do that with him like the video for Connected I'd said to him about Spike Lee and just said look it's that portraiture mm. element of what Spike Lee does I I want to hold those portraits and capture those moments as much as possible and he went to New York and captured locals in their natural environments and had a snapshot of that moment and it's like it God, that's good. it's just it's just perfect <sighs> in terms of it it encapsulates connection mm. in like in so many different ways and it's like it's it's been a really special project and it's really opened my eyes to just how vast this can become yeah. when you kind of just say you know what i'm gonna go all out and I'm going to see exactly what I can Fuck do I'm with this. It. Yeah, exactly. And just being like... You know what? I champion thanks, anybody that does that shit because it's bigger than the project itself. Yeah. The mission yeah, brief yeah. is more personal. Yeah. I love that shit, bro. And it's and that, I think that's the thing is like I I know that currently my, my vinyls are winging themselves from like, from like Berlin to here. And like I, I can't wait to have that physical product. Neither can we. And like, bring it on, dude. I mean, in the in the twelve inch vinyl, there's a there's a rocket cut out so you can make your own rocket ship. Like you know, I, I it's taking those sensibilities. If I remember when I was little, like my dad had a had a good vinyl collection and he had things like the Beatles cut out, yeah, yeah, yeah. like where there was all those different bits and like there were there were different albums that just had these different little things here and there and like the the sevens that were on the side of like cereal boxes mm. and all of these different things where it was playful, mm. you know, and, and like that's that's what we tried to embrace of like making something where it's like right. I love the I, I love vinyl toys anyway. Mm. It's like let's make a paper toy. Why not? Let's let's do it so that if you want to pull that out, you can make your own rocket. Yeah, yeah, that's hard. You know, and it's like it's just just having some fun with it and just exploring it. Yeah, yeah, <gasps> oh yeah. It's uh, it's been a big, big, big journey, man. But like you know, it's I'm excited to get aspects out in the world, and then in a way kind of let it go and free myself up to see what's next as well because mm. like i i know i have some different projects that are on horizon some of them are already done and it's just time mm. but i'm interested to see what the bigger body of work is next mm. on my own solo stuff because it's like i i know there's other bits on the bubble but that that always interests me to see where that's gonna head because i don't know like you know i don't know what's next in that sense but i've I've got some artists I would like to work with and I'd, I'd like to kind of see where it happens mm. and like what what goes on with that but I really don't know at this point and that's kind of cool. It's kind like, of cool. <laughs> it's very cool. Yeah. Where can people find out more about it? Because these, these are, you know, these are early days of further projects. We're, we're, we're on uh, aspects <laughs> at the moment. But, so where can people, where can people discover um, I mean, Instagram's the best route and I'm, I'm on there regularly so I can always chat to you but that's just Vice Beats. Yeah. Um, and then my my band camp's good because that's got my more of my production discography. We got on the band there. camp crew, you know you yeah, up. Come on. Yeah, for sure. Um, Come on, son. So 
like yeah viaspeaks.bandcamp.com I've got my own website so like viaspeaks.co.uk so mm. that kind of gives you a bit more of an impression of like the music side but also the branding and education side as well and then um, yeah they're the main things I suck on Twitter so I'm not there like that's <laughs> I suck uh, on Twitter. I'm, yeah I'm sorry Twitter crew we just don't do no Really, really don't. Ladies it's, and gentlemen, uh, yeah. fucking Vice Beats inside the place. The Thank mighty you for Vice having me, Beats man. inside the house. Thank yeah. you for having me. My pleasure, man. It's been an awesome journey. I really feel enlightened. <laughs> the whole room is 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 glorious and surround sound <laughs> from the good vibrations of Vice Beats. Thank you so much for joining Thank you, us, man. man. I appreciate it. Killer Keller Podcast, Allah, in was out of fashion. You get on with your day, enjoy yourself, get creative, keep up with the street culture. Don't talk to anyone, I wouldn't. You stay lucky, people. <laughs> Peace. <laughs> da, da. Yeah. Thank you, man. Much appreciated. <laughs>